Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon is Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention. The next event is scheduled for June 24th through 26, 2002 in Norman, Oklahoma. However, they need your help to put on the next event. Please visit SoonerCon.com to find out how you can help make SoonerCon 30 a reality. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. Welcome back, Stephen J. Rubin. How are you doing today? Great, Aaron. Great to be here. Thank you. I... We got to talking a couple of weeks ago, and I happened to mention that I had been doing a deep dive into Twilight Zone, and you literally wrote the book on the topic, so it, it suddenly sparked my interest quite a bit. Well, it's not surprising. Uh, I think that many of us who've lived through the last year feel like we've been living in the Twilight Zone, and I think every day people have Twilight Zone moments. It's become so much a part of the vernacular that revisiting the series is, in my, in my sense, uh, spending time with old relatives, you know, re- resuming that friendship. So not a surprise that you're interested in that series. Um, the world has changed a lot since Rod Serling first wrote those shows back in the late 50s, but hasn't changed that much. And it hasn't changed that much. And I'd almost say that you know, between him and several of his contemporaries, they kind of set the tone for modern science fiction. They did. They did. I think uh, you'd have to put Ray Bradbury in that group. Um, the people who created the Outer Limits TV series as well. Some of the great fantasy and science fiction authors. Um, you know, uh, I, I didn't know much about the making of the series when I first started this project. Back in 1982, a writer in California named Mark Scott Zacree wrote a book called The Twilight Zone Companion, which was my Bible for many years. It was the first time anybody had taken the time to review all 156 episodes. So there was information on every episode, but not a lot of behind the scenes information and very little information on the actual performers and the people who put the series together. So the reason, the motivation for writing the Twilight Zone Encyclopedia was to really dig under the fingernails of this show as much as possible and find a lot of the behind the scenes things that went on and the motivation for the episodes. And it was quite an experience for me. And I became very close with Rod's widow, Carol Serling, who opened the files for me, I got access to the original contracts with the performers, both behind the scenes and in front of the camera. I got all the photographs for the book. It was quite a pleasurable experience. And I really began to appreciate the show even more when I watched episode one through 156 in order over a few months period. And when you watch all the episodes, you realize the quality on this show was really off the charts. It was. And I think not looking into the motivation is is a big mistake, because as I was doing my research, I noticed that you have to understand this was a very personal project for Rod Serling. It was not something that he did on a whim or just for a paycheck. He poured his heart and soul into this. He did. He was a very frustrated man in 1959. Uh, For those of you who don't know his background, he uh, grew up in upstate New York. He was born in Syracuse, raised in Binghamton. Uh, Very inquisitive young boy. He he had a brother. Uh, Just was interested in everything and anything. And he went off to World War II. He was too short to be a paratrooper, yet he was able to figure out a way to get in. So he became a, a U.S. Army paratrooper in the Philippines and witnessed horror after horror. It was hardly the glorified military experience for Rod, as many men discovered. And uh, he came out of the war with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, He had nightmares. Uh, 
he was encouraged by a therapist in Chicago to channel into something. And in Rod's case, he channeled into becoming a writer. And he first wrote for radio in Cincinnati and then uh, moved to uh, New York and started writing for the live TV shows of the 1950s. And the frustrating thing for Rod as a writer was he was very much a, a moral, he's interested in people's morals, moral, mor, moral stories, morality plays, you know, stories about the human condition, real things that were affecting people at that time. Uh, television in the 1950s was controlled by the sponsors. They determined what shows they were going to sponsor, and they did not like issue television for that, mo for the most part. He, uh, there were exceptions. I mean, writers like Patty Shayefsky, Reginald Rose were getting shows on the air. Uh, Rod got his done. Uh, he was able to deal with some issues, but when he tried to dig deeper, he uh, got a lot of pushback. For instance, he was he was very interesting in telling the story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a young black man who was arrested for whistling at a, at a white woman in a small town in the South. And he was basically hanged by the neck by a mob and for doing that. And Rod wanted to tell that story. He felt it was very much of the time with all of the racial tensions. And a network executive actually said to him, you can make this story, Rod, but you got to turn him into a Mexican and Rod was outraged. He faced that a lot. He did a political show where he couldn't talk about politics. You know, he could do racism if he didn't talk about racism. I mean, basically he was handcuffed. And um, as the story goes, uh, he began to think that he literally would have to move to Mars to tell his stories. So in essence, the Twilight Zone was Rod moving to Mars to tell his stories, disguising his morality plays in science fiction, fantasy, and horror stories. And uh, he, it was a huge triumph, uh, a triumph on a scale that I don't think we've seen since. And it's worth noting that Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and Star Trek and, and those st stories of that era were like the first moment where science fiction was being taken seriously as a medium for the adults in the room. Uh, prior to that, it was always the the monster movies, the, the, the Buck Rogers serials, it was never really tried to, they didn't spin it as something that you would gear toward older audience. I call it the bastard science. It was the bastard genre. You know, you're absolutely right. I grew up going to science fiction movies in the 1950s and um, Saturday matinees the studios didn't consider science fiction an important genre. There was something for the kiddies. And in television, it was almost unknown at first. There were a few shows in the 50s. I'm remembering a show called World of Giants. I don't know if you know, it was kind of a forerunner of Land of the Giants. Uh, there was also a show um, called uh, Science Fiction Theater, which was an anthology series, kind of on this, at the same time they were showing shows like One Step Beyond and the Alfred Hitchcock show, but science fiction wasn't respected. I mean, considering all the great works of science fiction in history and some great movies, by the way, I mean, obviously in the 1950s showed us films like The Day the Earth Stood Still, Forbidden Planet, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, those pictures did enormously well. Um, but in television, sci-fi fantasy was not considered respectful. And I think that the advantage Rod Serling had in 1959 uh, coming to CBS was he had a reputation as being one of the top dramatic writers in the, in the world at that time. Also, he had done kind of a pseudo pilot. I don't know if you do. Do you know about the time element? I not really. I mean, I, I kind of heard about this a little bit, but I, I don't have a whole lot on it. It's a one hour show. It was released by Desi Liu. Uh, in fact, uh, it was a one off. It wasn't part of a series. It was basically uh, introduced by Desi Arnaz for the Desi Liu Playhouse. And it's basically a story of a, a, a New York bartender played wonderfully by William Bendix, the great comic actor of Life of Riley and the Babe Ruth story. <clears throat> 
who keeps having nightmares that he wakes up in, in Pearl Harbor. He's in a hotel room on December 6th, 1941. And he can't convince anybody that there's going to be a sneak attack the next day. And it's a great little what if uh, Twilight Zone type story. And that was called The Time Element. And the ratings for that one off were off the charts. So that encouraged CBS to ask Rod to come up with this series. Now, the other thing that was interesting that I learned is in 1959, James Aubrey came aboard CBS of head of programming. And I think he came in just after Rod's first season of Twilight Zone, I think either 59 or 60. And he was not a fan of anthology. He believed that TV viewers tuned in to their favorite stars. They tuned into Lucille Ball on I Love Lucy. They tuned into James Arness on Gunsmoke. They turned into Robert Stack on uh, The Untouchables. And he thought that the majority of viewers were not interested in anthology. In fact, one of the first things, the first things he did was cancel Playhouse 90, arguably one of the most uh, awarded television series in history. So this is a guy who really didn't want anything to do with, uh, with uh, anthology series. So Rod always had an uphill battle every year, convincing Aubrey to keep the show on the air. And in fact, after the third season, Aubrey canceled the show and put on a series called Fair Exchanged, which uh, laughingly was not a fair exchange. It bombed, and then Aubrey had in hand, had to go back to Serling and say, can you give us some episodes for the, the mid-year replacement. And so starting in January, uh, I think that was 62, they did 18 one-hour episodes, which essentially became the fourth season of The Twilight Zone. And now that you're mentioning that, you're jogging my memory here. If, correct me if I'm wrong, the time element had such a strong critical response and such high ratings that they actually did a second broadcast of it, which was unheard of at the time. I'm not sure if that's true. They okay. had done that with a show. Rod's first big success in live television was a show called Patterns with Van Heflin. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was the one that was uh, done again live, which was unheard of at that time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I had my, my productions missed up, but okay. But, but the time element was such a big success that it emboldened Rod to go to CBS with this anthology series at a time when anthology was kind of exiting. So the fact that uh, the Twilight Zone was able to stay on the air for five years is a, <clears throat> a great credit to Rod Serling. And it was not a ratings leader, by the way. CBS was always complaining that the ratings on the show were not great. I mean, it was very popular amongst college students. Um, it, I think the critics loved it, but the big shows of the day were getting much big, bigger numbers, substantially bigger numbers. Occasionally it would sneak into the top 20, but it was kind of a mid-range hit. But obviously with Rod Serling's name involved with it, it was considered prestigious for CBS to keep it on the air, even though their head of programming was not a fan. So if you were to look at who, who was watching, you said college students and so forth, what, what was the buzz of the time like? Was it, could you see a fandom building in there that was leading somewhere? It's an, it's an interesting question, Aaron. I think that... Um, well, one of the arguments against anthology is there were never characters you could follow from show to show. Obviously, if you're watching Gunsmoke, it's Matt Dillon every Tuesday night or whenever it was on. So they had to market an anthology show. You had to start from scratch each week, which put them kind of in a little bit of a underdog fashion. Um, I think people really expected to see something unusual and they got that each week. And I think that uh, it was certainly, and again, Rod Serling's name really helped uh, in intrigue adult viewers. Not really a kiddie show. I mean, I was eight when the show went on the air and I, I watched an episode called The Silence. 
about a guy who makes a bet with a guy in a club. He's kind of a motor mouth and he's driving them crazy. He says, I'll bet you $500,000 that you can't shut up for a year. And they put him in a glass room in the basement and they monitor him. I watched about 10 minutes of that. And it so freaked me out, you know, as an eight year old, the idea of not being able to talk for a year. I just, I couldn't watch anything like that. I went back to my cartoons, but um, you know, it wasn't really a kid's show. It's really a show that appealed to sophisticated viewers and sophisticated viewers who know Rod Serling's name. So there was probably a strong core of people who were interested in that show, but it, it wasn't getting the ratings of a series with continuing characters. And like you said earlier, this was something, this was a time when the, the audience was known for wanting Lucy and they were known for wanting silly distraction humor. And I mean, no, no disrespect to Lucy, but it's like they were looking for the comedies, the farces, and that was the total opposite of anything Twilight Zone. They were, they were. And, uh, you know, we're on, when, when the Twilight Zone went off in the air, air in 64, this was the era of the Beverly Hillbillies. You know, Green Acres, Gilligan's Island. I mean, these were the shows that were drawing people, escape shows. Uh, they didn't want you to necessarily think. You know, there are several Twilight Zone episodes dealing with major issues that were taboo everywhere else in the TV universe. I mean, Rod was the first one to do a Holocaust story. You know, uh, uh, Death Said Revisited with Joseph, Joseph Schildkraut. Uh, uh, the, 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 he had total control over what stories he could put on the air. That was one of the great things in his contract, which again was unheard of at that time. If Rod came up with a story idea, there wasn't no, there wasn't anybody you could say no. So none of the pushback he had in live television. So if he wanted to do a Holocaust story, he did a Holocaust story. If he didn't want to do a story. He wanted to do a story on child abuse. He did one on child abuse. The um, the uh, episode with Bill Moomy uh, about uh, the Vietnam War, dealing with a boy who's off in Vietnam uh, with Jack Klugman, the name will come to me in a second, um, was also, I think Rod was the first writer in Hollywood to mention Vietnam in a dramatic show. So, I mean, he was doing things that people just didn't do at that time. Um, unfortunately, his style of writing heavy dialogue, good dramatic dialogue, um, you know, at the expense of, you know, not necessarily a visual sense, was kind of going out of style by the mid 60s. <clears throat> Color shows were coming into vogue, and a lot of production value. Uh, so I think Rod, Rod's human stories were kind of getting to be a little obsolete in a way. If you think about it, his feature career, you would have thought that Rod Serling would have been a big guy in movies. But aside from Planet of the Apes and Seven Days in May, none of his stuff got made. I mean, he did very few movies and uh, it wasn't his strong suit. He wasn't interested in the visual side, the technical side. He was interested in the people and their dialogue and nobody could write dialogue like Rod Serling. That's another reason why I think those shows from 60 years ago still play beautifully today because there are real people dealing with situations that might be outrageous, but being done in a realistic manner. And, you know, if you're talking about a guy who has it put in his contract that he has absolute control over which stories get done. That's not the move of a guy who's just there to pull a paycheck. I mean, people, I've heard that Rod would actually, in his personal life, he would get into an argument with you if you found out that you went to anybody but his barber. And the reason that you had to go to his barber was because he went to the only barber in town that would cut the hair of people of color. That, th these issues meant that much to him that he he made it a point to work this into the show and that that was why he did it. Oh, no, it's so true. So true. Uh, he was one of the first Hollywood players to be against the Vietnam War and stood up for, uh, uh, you know, all that. And being a military veteran, he carried some clout. Um, he got into some terrible debates on the subject. He was castigated, but he stood his ground. I'm kind of glad that he's not around today because I think he would have 
<laughs> some of the people who claim to know what they're talking about in, in our world today, he would have um, browbeat them till the cows came home. You know, uh, in Rod's day, there were very few people who claimed to be experts. You know, they, you know, you know, this was the era of Walter Cronkite, who reported the news, you know, as a real visual, not a, re, a, no, a real expert, and just somebody who let people speak. And I think Rod believed in that kind of expertise. And uh, I think today, because of the internet, everybody's an expert. And I think that's not the world Rod came from. No, and that's one thing somebody was trying to talk to me about. You know, the the the, the importance or lack thereof of watching the news and i just i wasn't trying to make an absolute statement on it but i said you have to understand our grandparents and our parents were taught that if you watch the news then you were informed but that was at a time when the news was on for an hour and they actually had only an hour to tell you everything going on in the world when it's on 24 hours a day and they just need to fill that time suddenly a lot of things seem important when they're not and we don't hear things that are important Exactly. Exactly. And um, whether you're a CNN fan or a Fox News fan, I mean, when did it become a rule that people started to express their opinions? Press shouldn't express their opinions unless they're doing it on the editorial page of a newspaper. And I think in Rod's day, you heard the news and that's what you heard. You didn't hear people's opinions who had no business talking about their opinions. And um, he... Um, well, the other thing about Rod Serling, which has nothing to do with politics, is he kind of mastered the idea of the what if scenario. Every single episode of The Twilight Zone could be characterized by saying, what if a flying saucer landed in a small suburban neighborhood and people started freaking out about it? You know, you know what if a guy went back into time and tried to kill Adolf Hitler? I mean, these are kinds of stories that really gets your imagination going. And as a writer myself, I've always been very inspired by his feeling of, you know, think, think outside the box, think as outrageous as you want to be. Don't go with traditional things. If you have a story that's crazy, why not? And he, he encouraged everybody to do that. And I think that uh, he inspired the writers around him. You know, Rod, even though Rod wrote uh, 92 episodes, you know, uh, 70 or uh, let's see, uh, 64 of them were also written by other writers. And he had people like Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont, George Clayton Johnson, and they were given free reign to come up with outrageous stories. One of the most famous ones was written by by Matheson, which is the story of the man on the airliner who looks out his window and sees some some creature groping around on the airplane cowling. Uh, nightmare at 20,000 feet. By the way, the name of that Bill Mooney episode that I was thinking of before, that's the Vietnam episode, is called In Praise of Pip. I believe it's the first episode of the fifth season. And it, you know, uh, he, he just uh, was a very unique writer. And in many ways, probably the most significant writer of the 20th century, as far as I was concerned. Uh, you know, when you think back to school and the writers we study in school. We, we study F. Scott Fitzgerald. We study Hawthorne, Her Hemingway. I frankly think modern uh, literature courses should have a, a, a course in Rod Serling. I won't disagree there. As somebody who saw the show when it was first on, even if you were eight years old when it began, I, I really just want to kind of get my head around this question how did people really adapt to it when it was fresh? And by that, I mean, you watch an episode of The Twilight Zone, and so many of them look like a typical drama of the time. You don't realize, there's a, there's a certain point where you realize, okay, Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. But you don't know when that's going to hit. You don't know when you're going to find out that somebody's an alien, somebody's from the past, somebody... You, you, it's it's such a weird thing. You could sit down and think you were watching a completely normal drama until that Rod Serling moment happens. And how did that go over with the general public? Well, I have to confess that when I watched The Silence, I ran into my room, freaked out, and I didn't watch the show again until reruns. So uh, I am not the authority 
But I did in my readings and my research, I discovered what we call today water cool this water cooler discussion. You know, people watch the Twilight Zone. The next day at work, they talked about it around the water cooler. Did you hear that? Did you watch that movie? Ah! And it was, <laughs> it was just kind of, uh, it was a perfect fodder for the water cooler type of discussion, whether it was at a university or whether, whether it was at a business. Um, I think um, it was, you know, if you look at the shows that were on at the time, it was really a startlingly creative and clever way of telling stories uh, that were atypical. Um, but I wasn't there. Uh, well, I wasn't calculating the pulse at the time, Aaron, because I was too freaked out. Fair enough. I mean, I, I have to envy the people at that water cooler. I'm thinking of the t you know, our generation would have a show like that and it would be Game of Thrones and the big conversation would be who got killed. OK, and that's fun, but it's not the same as finding out that the guy in the diner was actually the Martian. I mean, it, it's just a whole new level of weird. Yeah, yeah. And I think it it certainly inspired a whole generation of creatives to say that we could we'd like to do shows like that. I mean, going all the way up to, uh, you know, uh, the guy who uh, wrote and directed uh, Getting Out, so which was the big hit a few years ago, that horror film, you know, the uh, Rod Serling's uh, ability to turn these clever stories out inspires people today. I mean, it's 60 years later. We're still talking about the Twilight Zone-esque type story. I've written several uh, spec scripts that dive right into that world. I'm out there every day trying to sell them. And uh, it's I consider Rod Serling one of my patron saints. Let me run this one by you because I well, you talked about Outer Limits and I love Outer Limits. I do. Um, but I never hear anybody talk about One Step Beyond. Is that within your wheelhouse? Not really. I remember okay. watching the show. Uh, it was certainly an eerie show. There were some interesting supernatural stories. Um, I, I was kind of more inclined to shift more towards science fiction than supernatural horror. That was not my strong suit. I grew up in the 1950s as an only child. I was scared of the dark. I did not like freaky movies. My first impressions of horror movies, I, I would sit in the lobby as my friends watched them. I just couldn't take it. I, I, I started to get my courage when I started to watch science fiction films like The Blob and, uh, you know, The Day of the Earth Stood Still. I, I got a little bit more of a courageous and I started to be able to watch some of the horror films. But to this day, I don't really enjoy horror films, especially to the extreme they've become today with the buckets of blood flowing, you know. I kind of, I'm more of a fan of Shirley Jackson's The Haunting, you know, the original directed by Robert Wise, where there's no visual horror whatsoever, but they, they, they scare the living bejesus out of you with a pounding on the doors. To this day, I hear that. Another film that really freaked me out was Poltergeist, the original, you know, just real creepy stuff, thanks to Toby Hooper. I can get behind you there. I, I've said before, I'm not a really horror guy per se I, I i will get into the original cinematic monster movies from the the classic era there's a couple of oddball ones here and there i can dig just for the camp value but i i much prefer something like a twilight zone where the the, the terror is in your mind the terror is in possibilities yeah yeah i mean one of my favorite twilight up uh, twilight zone episodes is the howling man which is the one about the guy who comes to that European monastery and every night he goes to bed, he hears someone howling or something howling. And it turns out they've got the, these, these, these priests, these uh, monks have the devil in a jail cell underground and he's howling. And uh, uh, this guy thinks they're all crazy. And uh, I won't spoil it for those of you who haven't seen it, but it's perhaps the most atmospheric of all the Twilight Zone episodes, creepy upon creepy. And that's the way to do it. And when you read that kind of stuff, you, so when you see that kind of stuff, you realize it could have easily been a, a story published in a magazine. And just because so much of it takes place in your own imagination, they, the actors and the directing just communicated in a slightly different fashion. But it it's really feels like a novel each time you watch the Twilight Zone. 
It's it, it's classic filmmaking done as a TV anthology series. Rod actually thought of the episodes as individual films. They happen to be short films, but they were to to films what uh, short stories were to novels. And uh, the other thing I, I have to say, since the series has been revived three times, most recently with Jordan Peele's late, Jordan Peele's latest, The Twilight Zone. Once you shoot a Twilight Zone in color, you lose 50% of the atmosphere. So I don't think the Twilight Zone ever works in color for, for my money. I think if you were able to turn the color off while you're watching a color episode, I bet you'd enjoy the episode better. I'm gonna because have to try that. Yeah, I think it's probably a good idea. I remember that um, the the cinematographer who worked on over a hundred episodes, his name was George Clemens. He was a perfectionist, and the look of those those film uh, the shows that were shot on film, all but six of the episodes of the series were shot on film. Unfortunately, James Aubrey decided to cut the budget in. Um, in uh, second season. So you see six videotaped episodes of The Twilight Zone, which are good episodes, but they look really bad now because they're a videotaped episodes. They look amateurish. Whereas the film episodes, if you watch them on Blu-ray today, they pop out at you and you, you see them sharper than they've ever looked. I love getting anything black and white on Blu-ray just because the, the combination of black and white film and the high definition, the detail is stunning absolutely oh, yeah. stunning it's funny because um, uh, the the i think it's the end of the thir uh, third season episode was a donald pleasant episode called the changing of the guard and donald pleasant plays this uh, this private school professor who is having a crisis of conscience and at one point in the show it shows him at his desk in his office at the school and behind him is his diploma well, this, the character he plays, I believe his name is Professor Fowler, but the name on the diploma behind his desk is a different name. So I said to myself, the art director probably never, or the set director never really thought that anybody would be that, have the ability to see the name on that diploma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the Twilight Zone reboots because there is one question I would like to ask, just and it's just to play with the idea. It, is the problem with some of the reboots, at least especially the better ones, is it just the name? And, and by that, I mean, could that be a fantastic show if it was caused, called anything else? It's a very good question. You know, I have not waded into the reboots. I started watching the Jordan Peele series. The first episode about the stand-up comic I thought was okay. Not great, but okay. But the second episode was somewhat of a reboot of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet with instead of having a creature on the wing, they had this iPad uh, and uh, telling him things. And it, Aaron, it was such a bad episode. And the ending was so horrible. It was the worst ending I've seen in a short show ever that I said, I'm done. I was done after two episodes. So I might've missed some really good episodes of the new reboot. I didn't watch the second, re the first reboot and I didn't watch the second reboot. You know, uh, I like Forrest Whitaker as an actor, uh, but when I saw him hosting, I said, where's Rod Serling? <laughs> so I wanna cut you loose soon, but where can we find the Twilight Zone Encyclopedia and why should we check it out? Well, it's, it's a fun book per se. You know, uh, if you want to know something about one of the actors on the show, where he worked with Rod before, or some of the other actors, or some of his background, I have over 500 bios in the encyclopedia on performers who are in the Twilight Zone. I have a lot of behind the scenes information, some really interesting arcane knowledge that, uh, that uh, I think people would find interesting. It's a good companion piece to read when you're watching an episode, I give you a little bit of the behind the scenes details. It works in a companion with uh, Zakri's book. The, the, you know, he's more of a critic, so he actually analyzes the episodes and gives you his criticisms. I'm not a critic on that level. I'm just providing you with more information and a lot of interesting photos. So I think it's a fun book and you can find it right now on Amazon, uh, The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia. And um, if anybody wants to comment on it, I have a couple of uh, 
web I, I have a couple of Facebook presences now I have a I have a, a, a page called Steve Rubin Saturday Night at the Movies where I publish reviews of classic movies every week and I also as most people know I have a book out on, called the James Bond movie encyclopedia and I have a title I have a page for that as well or you can simply write to Steve Rubin at Facebook and that's probably the best way to reach me. When we looked, talked about the James Bond encyclopedia, you mentioned that you had a lot of never before seen photos in there and material straight from archives. Can I assume that that's very similar to what's in the Twilight Zone encyclopedia? I, I think that there's a lot of material in the Twilight Zone encyclopedia that people haven't seen before. I've, I've managed to call from a, different archives and uh, the, the combination of the photos and the information in the book, I think, is, is fun. I, I, when I write about pop culture, I try to have fun with it. I'm not trying to drone on and on about things. The entries are short and concise. I, although I give you Rod's opening narration, I don't give you his closing narration, and I only give you a setup of the plot. I'm not giving away details. So if you haven't seen Twilight Zone episodes, I'm not going to give away them away for you. For, uh, give them away to you in the book. You're going to have to watch the episode. That is a real, real kindness on your part. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Absolutely. Always fun talking to you, Aaron. Nice, it's fun talking to you. Everything you mentioned is going to be in the show notes, links to your books, the links to your social media. So whatever we've discussed here, people should have easy access to at AaronBosick.com. Thank you. Steve, thanks so much for being here. I hope to have you back real soon.